I'm going to talk about uh, an odd area. Now, normally when I give uh, uh, talks, uh, people know my background to begin with and, and can ask me to speak about my background because it's, it's diverse and very long. And uh, uh, it's on a topic that people uh, consider culturally unacceptable to talk about, meaning it's um, uh, when you speak about yourself, if you spoke about how well endowed you were as a man, that would be considered uh, politically incorrect. If you speak about how intelligent you are, that's politically incorrect or culturally incorrect. Um, I'm going to get up here and talk about how intelligent I am or how intelligent are the people around me because it's a topic that is a bit taboo. Um, uh, smart people sit around talking about how smart they are. And they talk about it so much that they begin to break down what it really means to be smart. And we begin to analyze each other. So uh, let me back up just a little bit here. Um, the topic that I want to talk about now is something that is something I can do well, which is I can rip apart the meanings of words people take for granted. Um, my favorite two words, which I'll hit at the end, is ethics versus morals, because people don't usually know what the meaning of those two words are, and they are the, they are the compass in my life. Um, but the words I'm going to talk about right now, the reason Ken asked me to come speak is because I had made a mention in another talk, a little tiny part of it, was about the breaking down of what is the word intelligence or smart or clever or brilliant. These are four words that I hear people use often. And I'm going to sum it up um, with a reference. I don't watch much television, but there's a show that someone pointed out to me. And I thought it was a frivolous show. And then I started watching it, realizing it's one of the best written shows I've ever seen about smart people. And it's called um, uh, The Big Bang. And there's a character on it named Sheldon. And, uh, and uh, uh, this little scene sums up uh, Sheldon. I'm not going to act this out too much for you because I'm not an actor. But um, uh, Sheldon is a uh, theoretical physicist. And he's sort of asexual, as best you can tell. And uh, he has, he's, he, he, he's, he's very persnickety, um, doesn't seem to like anything. And he, uh, he comes from a trailer trash life. And for a smart person, this is a very common thing. You'll hear things, they'll, they'll speak about it normally, whereas most people would hide that information. To him, it's just the nightmare of how he was born. And he finds everybody to be simple at best. And so he speaks of them just equally. And his sister comes, I guess, a fraternal uh, twin of his, uh, completely different than him, of course. And she's very attractive. And of course, the whole show is about how attractive she is and how everyone's stunned that Sheldon's sister is attractive. And they've made, he doesn't really understand why she's there. He doesn't particularly like her. He has no connection to her whatsoever. He views his family as just what caused him. Now it's gone. Now he goes on and lives his life. And so they're leaving. She, she, she's leaving. She spent the, uh, the day with him. And uh, uh, he tries to say that he kind of enjoyed having her around for a moment. And uh, as she's walking out, she says, um, she says, oh, yeah, I tell my friends about you. And he goes, oh, really? What do you tell your friends about me? And, and she says, oh, I tell them my, 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 my brother, the rocket scientist. He goes, what? You call me a rocket scientist? I'm not a rocket scientist. You might as well tell people that I'm a, I'm a toll booth operator on the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> that scene sums up what I'm about to talk about. Among my friends, about as insulting as you can get is to call one of us a rocket scientist. It's a true statement. And the reason this is a true statement is because, no offense to any rocket scientists that happen to be here that not intended by me personally, I do intend it later, um, is that rocket scientists fundamentally do primitive calculations. They are the ditch diggers of mathematics. They, they calculate parabolas and so forth. There are ones that do something more useful, I'm sure. Don't try to beat me up, not that you could, because you've never lifted anything in your life. But. <laughs> That is a rocket scientist. <coughs> he is a theoretical physicist. So he doesn't do anything at all. He just thinks about things that could be done. So I'm going to break down these four words for you in uh, not to say that I'm right and not to say that these are the accurate definitions. What they are, however, is the researched definitions I've done to best extrapolate very similarly to uh, how Catherine said, you know, there's no data here. I like to look at words similarly. I'm not, I'm not a linguist necessarily, but I do like to look at words and say, well, what is the best word to use here? And you have to often put the words side by side and say, well, they're kind of blurry, but we clearly see this word has this one meaning and this one has this other meaning, and this isn't mentioning this, so that's got you know, that's a negative. And so then eventually you say, okay, I would use these four words or these two words or whatever a specific way. So I'm going to start with the word clever. And uh, clever. Uh, is a word I use to mean uh, that it is somebody who can use their intelligence or their memory, not necessarily both or not necessarily one or the other at a given time, to gain something for themselves. Uh, I find, um, while I happen to have a, a strange like of lawyers, um, I find many lawyers to be clever. Uh, I listen to them and, oh, yeah, that, that was clever. I don't know 
how you came to that conclusion, but it, it'll work well for you, how, however, you're, however you're thinking about it. So, um, so, I, so you Clover, and, and I'm going to move away from Clover, I'm going to move to much more personal, and this will be the closest thing I come to a story, uh, to stories of, of my very close personal friends. When I define personal close friends, they've slept at my house, I've slept at their house, we've spent much time together. Um, that's, I, I use that word very specifically. Uh, and, and I want to speak about uh, intelligence. and, and uh, one of my, my, my very closest friends, the person I, I talk to every single day, we, we share all information, he's, he's, he's a hermit. He lives in a little cave in the middle of nowhere uh, at any given moment. He often lives in my homes, wherever they are. And uh, uh, he, when, to meet him, you might even think he's homeless. Uh, he has an air about him of that. Um, when Steve Jobs speaks about the things that make Steve the proudest of Apple, he is probably des describing something that my friend Brandon has invented. Uh, he has actually mentioned it in many of his speeches. Many of my friends are the people who built the original stuff for Apple. Uh, 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 Brandon is the guy who designed the original accurate handwriting recognition. You could take a doctor's writing and it would figure out what that person just tried to say. And it would produce something. He did this several decades ago. Uh, more recently, he built some little toy and sold it to uh, Adobe and, and, and then he disappeared into the world. So uh, Brandon is uh, my definition of not clever, he is intelligent. He has very little memory. Uh, he, often I have to remind him what we just talked about two weeks ago. And he asks me for it, because he knows I'll give him the, the truth. I, I, I'll never misrepresent something to him. And so we, we try to keep a log of things because he has a poor memory. But he has an amazing machine in his head for processing almost anything. And he's a natural debunker. He, is a na he, he can look at a problem and say, no, that's not the problem. The problem's over here, because he's not uh, uh, bogged down with the filters of television, which he doesn't watch. He doesn't. He has ad blocker his whole life. He doesn't look at ads at all. He he is he is completely laser focused on the things he's interested in. He is constantly refining and dealing with his own life and what he wants to make perfect. He is my definition of intelligent. And he and I will debate. I said to him once, "Now you're far more intelligent, and you solve things." He goes, "No, no, you are." And I said, "No, the only reason you think I am is because you have no memory." So you can't remember that we've had this conversation before where I proved to you that you were actually more intelligent. So, um, but both of us agreed, neither of us are terribly clever and we kind of wish we were because it seems always to be the fast path to getting something done. We can never find the fast path because we end up analyzing every single one of the paths. And as Catherine and I are again talking, I've built many homes for myself and every, no one solved this problem already? I have to go solve the plumbing. I end up doing the plumbing myself. I just do it all, I redesign it. I go on the web, try to find something in Europe. They may have already invented something and solve that. Yes, it's, it's a nightmare being OCD. Um, you're, you're whole life stops and you have to go solve and then reinvent the pencil and the paper again. So that's how every single handheld device comes into existence. Let's reinvent the paper and the pencil. This will work. Um, just needs batteries. So <clears throat> he's intelligent. Now I'm going to jump to smart. I have another friend uh, who is a theoretical physicist. Um, in fact, when I first met him, uh, we became friends very quickly and uh, we, we met on a beach and he had a surfboard and uh, many of my stories, I met Brandon also on a beach uh, while he had a surfboard. And um, uh, I, li I live in Maui and so that's a lot of my concepts are just people on beaches. And, uh, uh, but his board was different. He had symbols on his board. A lot of people have symbols on their boards, you know, wa wa wacky, you know, tattoo looking things. But his was the wave theory as a formula written out on his board. <laughs> This guy, me, we're gonna get along. <laughs> no one realized, no one there ever knew that he had a wave theory on his board, but that's, that's what was actually on there. Um, uh, and, and this story that I'm telling you about him is he was on the beach, unrelated to me, he was on the beach, hanging out, surfing, living in a van, on a cliff. And he was out on the, by the beach and he started talking to some other surfer guy and they're talking and the surfer guy says to him uh, his problems and Garrett's listening and this guy's problems is that he, he uh, uh, he needs to go hire somebody, and it's stressing him. And he's, Garrett says, well, what do you need? And he says, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the head of the uh, college. And uh, he goes, oh, yeah, that's, uh, it's a you know, cute, cute college in the area. And he says uh, he's, he needs a, a, a theoretical physicist to, to teach, a, teach a class. And Garrett goes, well, I can do that. And you can just imagine two surfers sitting there and someone saying, I, I can do that. And the guy doesn't know who Garrett is and says, uh, um, you can do that? He goes, yeah, I've got a you know, few majors. I think I have a PhD in physics. I can, I, I, can, I can teach that class. And so they began talking about it. And, and Garrett hemmed and hawed because Garrett was realizing that he was now going to have a job. <laughs> Garrett had managed in his life to invest wisely and be extremely cautious with money and very cautious with the people and the time he spends to live in a van surfing every day. That's what he did. He accepted the job at the college for a short period of time because it gave him web access and an air-conditioned room. Then he had to teach students, and that was not so good for him. So, because he'd wake up every morning out of his van, which he parked on this 
premises that he was not allowed to tell anybody about and he'd take a quick shower and walk into his classroom and start teaching, not physics, it turned out he was teaching everybody how to fix a car because that was the real topic of physics at this particular college. And so he eventually left. It was, but it was, a funny, it was funny for him, he had to go learn how a car worked, he'd never looked at one. He's a theoretical physicist, they don't do anything. Almost always. But then once in a while, they discover something. So, but Garrett is very, very smart. And my definition of smart is not necessarily that you're intelligent or clever, but rather that you use your resources to get happiness. And this is something that among very smart people, often engineers and scientists and architects and so forth, uh, they forget. They are often caught up in the fun things that they do day to day and we get caught up in our little OCDs. Uh, however, we're not usually very smart. And it's very easy. When, we, when, when someone among the group says that person's smart, everyone goes, really? That one? What, what made that person smart? Because they must be happy. Whereas in the normal uh, group of people, the normal world, if you said somebody was smart, it would tend to mean that they were clever or intelligent. They had lots of money or they had gotten the best man, the best woman, whatever it is that you think that's important to you. Uh, they lived in the best place. How smart are you? And, and clearly among the three of us, we look at, we look at this gentleman and say, no, you're, you're, you're smartest and you're most intelligent, et cetera. And now I'm going to juxtapose this to my last friend who in this, in this story, um, who represents brilliance. And I'd never even thought about the word brilliance. I, I, I think, in fact, recently, I, I think some, somebody is pushing for in a skeptic organization for the word bright to mean somebody who's exceptional or something. And so it's based on brilliance, of course. Um, but brilliance is a fascinating word to me. It's, it's these two gentlemen, I genuinely believe, are brilliant. I watched them and went, wow, that's, I, I know kind of how you're doing it, but you have talent plus skill plus a willingness to do it and energy. That's brilliant, I, I was amazed. And my friend Dave is, who's, who's, who's a dear human being, he's he, the first person to take me to Hawaii and make me aware of the environment. He, um, he says to me um, uh, one day as we're sitting there and I'm describing something to him, and he looks at me and he says, you know, Reichert, I don't really think I can keep up with you on all this. You know, you just go just too deep for me. You just think about things too deeply. And I looked at him and thought, wow, that was really honest. That, that, that was really, and I thought, he goes, I'm just not that smart. I'm not that intelligent. And this is what kicked me off to begin thinking about, well, wait, what do those words mean? Because I think of you as absolutely very smart and very intelligent. And we began to talk, and I, right after him telling me that he couldn't go very deep with these conversations, I forced him into a very deep conversation about being intelligent and smart. And we began to realize, yeah, we had to isolate those words out. No, he's brilliant, because what he does, he's the uh, art director for Sony, uh, lead art director, senior art director, and he's the guy they come to and say, watch this movie. Pick a single frame out of this movie that will represent the whole movie. And so I'll use as an example like Forrest Gump, where Forrest Gump could have had the cover be a kid running with you know, braces falling off. And that would have been a very interesting scene. I actually saw that as one of the concepts one person brought. But he's the one who says, as an example, sit down on the bench, have the box of chocolates, have the feather falling. That's the thing that everyone's going to remember. That's the thing that's going to become a symbol in your mind. That's brilliance. That is the definition to me of brilliance. It's not just that the rest of us couldn't think of it. It is that he understands what he's thinking about in a construct that the rest of us don't understand. It's not based on a science. There's no logic we can follow. An intelligent person understands what he did, has no idea how to do it. A smart person appreciates that he does it. As long as it makes him happy, they're good with it too. And the clever person will definitely exploit him and get 10% of everything he makes. <laughs> so. With that, those are the definitions of those four words. And when you, and the reason I brought all this up is I have a deep, a deep motivation here to demystify, to debunk, to cause people to stop before they put value in somebody else as an idol. Don't ever say to one of us that, oh, you're so smart, you're so intelligent. We all are. In fact, just to sum up this whole thing, a magazine many years ago did a report on a whole bunch of smart people that were considered popularly to be smart and asked them what made them smart and every single one of them answered the same way. I'm not smart, I'm not intelligent, I'm not any of these things. I just didn't give up. And that was it. All of them said the same thing. Every person I know says the same thing. They don't actually really believe they're smart. So I'll leave it at that and thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>